Welcome to Waiting on the Trade, a monthly comics book club for people who can't keep up with monthly comics. I'm Matt Ledger. I'm Patrick Fitzgerald Fleck. And I'm Tyler Marifke. This month we're talking about Doctor Strange, The Way of the Weird, the first entry in Jason Aaron, Chris Bocciolo, and company's time with the Sorcerer Supreme. So in case you guys need a refresher... The Way of the Weird is a reintroduction to the wild, wacky world of Stephen Strange. However, not all is right with the good doctor. By the end of this volume, Stephen's soul is at least slightly shredded, and magic itself is on the fritz. And he's bleeding black out of his eyes. And yeah. he lost one of them. It's gone. Is it gone, or is it just lots of black? No, I'm pretty sure one of them's gone, because he's got... I, this is, well, I only picked this up on my third read, Pat. This is why I read it three times. <laughs> For the eye. <laughs> For the eye. His left eye is open and his right eye is just not there. I think they're both there. They're just colored. Thank know. you. Thank you, Tyler. I don't know. Now I guess I'm everyone's going to have to buy it to find out. He definitely has pupils in that one eye. Yeah. I like we, that we started our discussion at the very last page of the book. His, you know how people be like, no, when they get doesn't. punched in the face, they sometimes get red all in the like. The okay, I kind of see eye. what you're saying. I like my interpretation of it better, but I see what you're saying. He's bleeding black. It's he's got a yeah. It's, he's got there's bound eye. to be some. There's bound to be some discoloration when you're bleeding from your eyeballs. Well, then why would the other eye not be the same color? Shadowing. Matthew, it's more dynamic to have one eye be like that than both eyes, don't you think? Yes, I agree. Also, it's oh, Dr. Strange. It, none, nothing's really supposed to make sense. This is true. <laughs> well, this is the volume for you. This, this is it right here. <laughs> My goodness. All right, let's reel it back in. We'll back okay. it up. <laughs> Tyler, welcome back. Oh, hey, yeah. Uh, happy to be back. <laughs> How's it going with you guys? Oh, it's going. Oh, it is. It's things are progressing. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> we ended our last podcast saying, "How could it get any worse?" And then we're here. So proof it can. It can always get worse. We're just not going to say anything and just hope for the best. I think point. I'm going to celebrate New Year's again on February first. That's where, uh, what I'm feeling, honestly. <sighs> yeah. Welcome to the special um, late 2020 edition of Waiting on the Trade. Right, right. I'm this... hoping everything next week goes smoothly, everyone. Buckle down. Let's be fair. By the by the time this comes out, this could be a real shithole of a place. I mean, there might not even be podcasts anymore, so I don't know right. what we're <laughs> We'll fix it in post. It's fine. Amazon web servers aren't going to boot us off, Pat. <laughs> Who's to say, Matt? Who's to say? That's true. This book, though, this book was good. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, the book. <laughs> so, Tyler, how did you, like, pivot from your love of all things Marvel to Doctor Strange? Because I don't think I've heard you, I don't know, be into Doctor Strange before. Yeah, this is kind of one of those ones that people don't know that I'm a big Doctor Strange fan. Um but I'm mostly a Doctor Strange fan, and I'm going to admit this. Mostly from the movie. Um, I'm going to ask if it was a movie. Yeah. Then. Okay. Uh, so I've always been intrigued by Doctor Strange. And I think we can all agree that we somewhat became Doctor Strange fans at the same time. And that was Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1. Yes. Um, when he became a playable character. And Holy you God, got yes. to turn people... Oh, yes. In two boxes. Yes, boxes. <laughs> the box spell from Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1 got me intrigued with Doctor Strange. Because the rest of that uh, game and the characters and stuff, you meet all of them, they're pretty much your straightforward hero types, right? Yep. Save for maybe Deadpool or whatever. Um, but uh, then you get to Doctor Strange. All of my points, Tyler. All yep. of my leveling points went into that one spell. Matt judged me for a while, but then he was on team box at the end. Because you had like a hundred percent hit rate of turning an enemy into a box. Everything was a box. <laughs> I feel like that's what happened with 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 uh with everybody is once you figured out that that spell could do that. He had the best spells though. You not only could you turn people into a box, he had the one where it would flip them over and spin them around and then bounce them off of the walls. And it would break things. Do you guys remember that one? No, I never used it. I, never used that <laughs> I would be surprised if I ever used it. So he had all these awesome spells, and I was like, this guy, he knows what's up. 
I'm going to start reading uh, Doctor Strange if I can ever find it, and then I just never did. There's not a ton of, like, high-profile Doctor Strange books out there. Like, when I was reading interviews about this series, this is the first time Doctor Strange had had an ongoing series in, like, 10 years, I think they said. That sounds right, because this came out in 2015. Yeah, and they might have been counting that, like, mini series that Brian K. Vaughn did as an ongoing series. But yeah, he he was always like the cameo master. Like he would show up at like these big gravitas moments where you knew stuff was real. Like uh, one of my first uh, favorite things with him was him fighting Ghost Rider in uh, the Ghost Rider run that we did a long time ago when I was like <laughs> my second show in here or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, early in that run, there's a Doctor Strange versus Ghost Rider fight, and it's fantastic. And so that even more was like, you know, I got to get into this guy because he's very Ghost Rider esque in the sense that he fights all these things that the he rest deals of with the powers beyond like the normal yeah. superheroes have to deal with. Yeah. So I always kind of got into that. Like the Ghost Rider stuff has always been, you know, he's dealing with keeping hell under control so the world doesn't go to shit. And Doctor Strange is dealing with the rest of it. <laughs> and I just find that fascinating. <laughs> like, these heroes that are like, uh, okay, fine, yeah, you go fight, you know, Green Goblin or whatever, that's fine. Or... Like, Spider-Man's out here having trouble with a bank robber. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, as they call him in here every time, the Dread Dormammu shows up, and <laughs> uh, you know, Doctor Strange is the only one who, you know, can take him on, so. Stuff like that, and has always kind of drawn me to the character. And then, all of a sudden, Marvel comes out and says, hey, yeah, Jason Aaron's going to write Doctor Strange, and that's all it took for me to... That sounds correct. <laughs> to be like, yep, okay, I'm in. And this was right after his Thor run. So this was... Uh, or I think he was doing both at the same I time. Say, I think it was concurrent. I think it's yeah. about the time that, spoiler alert, Jane Foster became Thor, because in yeah. one of the interviews I was reading, he was talking about how... Like, he was talking around Thor's identity, so it was probably, like, before they had revealed who she was, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think, because this was all in that that big relaunch, because there was female Thor, and then the, the new Iron Man, and, and Sam Wilson became Captain America, and a lot of that was all happening at the same time, and this comic kind of flew in under the radar. I don't, I don't recall, like, there was kind of some hype when it was coming out, or, like, right when it was about to come out. And then I kind of recall it, like, no one really talking much about it, which is kind of weird, because, like, it's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's entertaining stuff. And uh, the fact that kind of everybody just glossed over it. And it could be because there was so much um, backlash and other things that were distracting people from it. Like, this one was the status quo. This, nothing changed for Doctor Strange, really, when this came out. Right, he's still doing magic, and he's still, you know, fighting cosmic beings and things mm-hmm. like that. But everybody was so pissed off that there was a female Thor, and there was a black Captain America, and there was, you know, changes that nobody wanted done because nobody can accept that stuff. Oh, wow! I should have That's... made Stephen Strange gay. I should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> just, for, just to just to do something, right? And yeah, um, come on. He's like very much like in continuity. Uh, what's the best way to put it? A man about town before, like before this, like dude's got, dude's got bond girls essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they kind of reference that a couple times, which is good. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's Tony Stark, but with magic tricks. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think that didn't help because there was so much animosity towards Marvel at the time that I think people were more willing to just be ticked off about it than actually go and see what the good stuff was. Because another one that, at the time, that flew under the radar was also like Ant-Man came out at that same time. And that comic was really, really good. And everybody kind of was like, who cares about Ant-Man, too? And there was a lot of really good comics that came out, but everyone was all pissed off and wasn't reading it. So this is kind of a hidden gem. Yeah, I remember... Like on the the backlash topic, I do remember one thing that I like read about when this was coming out was people reacted very negatively to 
Doctor Strange having like a bunch of Oriental like kind of I don't know like not like basically like people absorbing his pain. <laughs> yeah, you know, like which which, which gets revealed. There, I think. The... Yeah, that that was another like oh crap moment. <laughs> which I mean, I'm sure if if we break it down page by or uh, issue by issue, that part was definitely a oh shit moment. Yeah, yeah, but I think like just the subtext of that, and people kind of got riled up about it at the time a bit. But that's most of what I remember people talking about this book for, which is not like there's lots of other things to say about this book, which I guess we'll say now. We will be the the judges of this book, the sayers, yeah. the sayers of the things. <laughs> we'll be something. I really enjoyed like how the book started, where it's kind of just like. A Tuesday in the life of Doctor Strange. Uh, yeah, I think it's 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 Jason Aaron esque in the fact that you all know his story. You know where Doctor Strange came from. You know why he's Doctor Strange. I did appreciate the the yeah that montage of like all the older comic book panels explaining his background and who and what he is and what he's up to before they throw you into the new stuff. I like that. Yeah, which I think they grab stuff from pretty much every notable doctor strange era like there's stuff that looks like it's from well there's stuff that's definitely from the stanley steve ditko original stuff like that third Mm -hmm. row the very right side like i've read some of that stuff and like (laughs) it just looks so odd right (laughs) yeah that's some that's some og doctor strange right there yeah and then that stuff on the top is from like this one of the 70s runs i think and some of the stuff like bottom left and then the ones that look like they're Marcos Martin art are Marcos Martin art from that one he and um, Brian K. Vaughn did in like 2005, which I think was the last real quote unquote Doctor Strange story before this series started. Yeah, it's a it's a nice it's a nice introduction that allows you to kind of see what's going on without. Well, it cuts a corner, but it doesn't do it cheaply. So it's it's a good thing. But yeah, the fact that this is just a normal Tuesday. It's yeah. A good line. <laughs> You know, you know, you're not getting like the uh, what's the what's the best word like the overly pompous, like almost ridiculous Doctor Strange. You're getting a whole new take on him for sure. See, I kind of like that Doctor Strange, though. Like that's part of I really appreciated the take of him being a little bit more Marvel movie Tony Starkish, I guess. But I also kind of miss the like Stanley bloviating version too at the same time so i was a little torn about that actually like i like both takes but every once in a while i would have like appreciated a nod towards just being a little bit more verbose in that classic stanley nonsense fashion do you think marvel has a hard time differentiating their characters like the fact that you brought up stephen strange and an iron man tony stark but then i'm also comparing in my mind uh stephen strange to mr fantastic like they seem really similar to me where one is science and one is magic, but their characters are so similar. Well, like all three of those characters are kind of like masters of the thing they do. Right. Sure. So it's sort of the same. I would say Dr. Strange isn't as big a jerk as Reed Richards. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> true. Which is funny. Cause Reed Richards used to be like easily one of my favorite heroes, if not my favorite. And I have slowly, but surely gone away from that i think reed richards is a complete jerk he's probably being written wrong so there's that (laughs) i feel like people have a hard time writing him possibly because he's supposed to be so smart in comparison to everyone else like right that's what i would think dr strange would be too right see but dr strange doesn't really have to be smart right like he's more knowledgeable than you about the stuff he does but like at the end of the day i mean i guess he's still like a former surgeon too but like at the same time yeah. like he's not, he's not inventing armor in a cave right like he's waving his hands yeah he's just got really good memory <laughs> he memorizes all the all the different spells from all the books that he has and that's uh that's his superpower <laughs> is memorizing know, spells moons Manipur has though messed it up he's supposed he did to he just messed it up <laughs> yeah and here he is 10 no 12 12 moons um, that's good stuff. <laughs> Pat, as a person, well, I guess, did we all end up reading it digitally this time, or did yeah, Pat, you're a person. 
I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> nice Tyler, good validation every once in a while. Tyler, did you read a physical copy of this or a digital copy of this this time? Uh, I read the digital copy, but I have the physical copy. But like I said, I didn't have it with me when we decided to do this, and I wasn't about to go try and track it down. Yeah, been there. <laughs> yeah. How did we feel about all these double page spreads at the front of especially issue one? <laughs> Boy, in paper form, they're fantastic. In digital form, it's kind of hard to read this damn thing. I mean, even digitally, it's not terrible. No, it's definitely... So Pat and I had just read um, Sandman Endless Nights, and like there were literally sections of the... Oh, I'm going to not even try for... Delirium? Sin, Sinkevich. Bill Sinkevich's Delirium section, yeah. Uh um that like i just couldn't get through right pat so like it definitely wasn't that like to that extreme but it's also the way it's set up like the page layouts are supposed to be weird because the whole book is supposed to be weird right so there is an element of it to that but i also never got lost on the page which was nice even on like my tiny ear chromebook screen and the guided view actually worked really well for this oh we like have it go panel by panel or whatever yeah so like i would like look at the whole thing as a whole and then go panel by panel and like it was actually really easy to read which i think is a function of the pages being laid out really well both artistically and the lettering is laid out in such a way that it helps your eye track across the page like i think the letterer on this is cory petite and there are pages that i think would just wildly fail if the lettering wasn't in the exact right spot <laughs> So that was kind of cool. That's a thing that you don't always notice as much, but I think it does a lot of heavy lifting in this book with some of the weirder page layouts. Well, I mean, it's supposed to be. It's called The Way of the Weird, and it does a, it does a good job of kind of showing you that you're not getting your normal comic book experience in this. You're not getting your, here's your panels, and here's a big splash page that has some cool stuff. It's like, yeah, Doctor Strange is using this page break as a as a step or whatever like it's it yeah. kind of it or like on the one where it shows the the uh the i don't know the f the female plant thing where he's like chick digs me right like <laughs> that that whole thing leading up to the champion or whatever like using that tentacle grass thing as like the page break to show where to read is really well done yeah, it just like draws your eye across the page to the next moment of action, like without yeah. it being panel by panel by panel. And like, it's a tricky thing to get right. And Chris Bacello does it really well in this book, like throughout the entire book. There's a page in issue two where Doctor Strange and Zelma are like walking up and down the stairs in his house. Mm -hmm. And they're on like seven different staircases at the same time it'd be really easy to get lost on that page but just where they are and also the like where the balloons are positioned on the page just like kicks your eyes across the page and then down like really smoothly so a plus work on page layouts that could otherwise like easily have taken this book off course but instead make it feel weird without making it feel unreadable which is sweet <laughs> yeah, and the art overall in my opinion is fantastic um the way that they do the the coloring uh like when he goes into his third eye mode or whatever you want to call it to see stuff and everything else goes black and white yeah those are cool um the other thing i notice is like pulling real world looking textures and inserting them into things or like real world looking photos potentially like even on this um what the second double page spread so i guess it'd be pages four and five you can see this teddy bear has like what looks like real teddy bear texture to it instead of drawn teddy bear texture right yeah and there's stuff like that throughout the whole book like when he's going into the ocean to go to that temple um like that's all seems like it's pulled from real world textures and like there's a image of new york that has the same thing going on and like that's pretty cool <laughs> and I think kind of a callback to some of the older comics where people used to do that sort of like photo collage thing a little bit more than they do these days. Yeah, everything looks like it was done with a purpose just to 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 kind of make something stand out or draw your attention somewhere, which is uh, which is really neat. Really, really neat. Yeah. 
Sorry, I'm just paging through it, looking at the pages, which is the sign of a good book. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so basically Dr. Strange is removing these soul eaters from this six-year-old boy. Little kid, yeah. yeah. And sending them to Rikers Island. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was nice. A nice touch. Uh, but also the page where, um, like, they, uh, the two parents are like, can, can you hear us, you know, and all that? Kind of the, the same thing I was talking about earlier, how Doctor Strange doesn't get any of the credit that he probably deserves. He's got Spider-Man on his wall. And Wolverine, Wolverine on his wall. And what looks, looks like, like he's a, got a, a Ben thing, Grimm. Action figure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> action figure. And here's Doctor Strange full up saving his life. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, go buy your neighbor a cake and a goldfish. That's his payment. That's all he wants. It's brilliant. Brilliant yeah. stuff. <laughs> I don't know if it's just because I've been watching a lot of Doctor Who recently or because this actually feels a lot like Doctor Who. Pat, maybe you have an opinion, but like this feels a lot like Doctor Who to me. Like if Doctor Who was magic, especially when Zelma shows up later on. For sure. It's a knowledgeable person leading a novice through a strange world, right? Yeah, but like even just Doctor Strange is like like attitude towards the world he lives in, like where he enjoys being him. Like he says on that first page, like I'd be lying if I had said I wasn't enjoying this. Like the stakes are pretty high, especially by the end of the volume, but like he enjoys being the guy who like confronts this weird stuff, which is cool. Like I don't need a morose, I don't need a morose guy in this book. Give me Stephen Strange. Well, sure. in the same fact that there's a price that he pays that he doesn't show. That he yeah. keeps to himself. Or, it's you know, kind of... dozens of Asian monks. <laughs> There's that. But he, <laughs> it's, it's kind of his uh, nature, too, I think, a little bit, because he enjoyed being a surgeon so much and, and all the, the stuff it got him and all that. So you kind of think maybe he enjoys being playing the hero. Mm -hmm. Like he could then. Only now it's a different type of hero, obviously, but... You could definitely uh, uh, kind of chalk it up to that too, and the fact where he's like, "Yep, this is this is awesome." Only he doesn't get all the money, and apparently not the girls anymore either. I don't know about that, man. <laughs> you read some of the older Doctor Strange stuff; he get, he gets the girls. <laughs> I'm saying right now in this one, he got the Soul Eater. Is that good enough? That's <laughs> true. He did get the Soul Eater, <laughs> and he was chopping up her tentacles like not a panel before. So I don't know. She must really be into him. <laughs> hey, some people are into that kind of stuff. I was going to say, maybe that's what Soul Eater's like. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Nobody knew we were getting Fifty Shades of Grey when we were <laughs> when we signed tuning up into them. a Doctor Strange thing. <clears throat> <laughs> that reminds me of some of the hands of the parents and stuff. A little loose. A little, you know. That's okay. There's, there's really detailed art later on. <laughs> so, <laughs> puts his efforts where it's needed. I'm seeing the hand you're talking about. I think lots of, yeah, the hands in a bunch of those panels. <laughs> so just like there are five things coming out of this clump. It's a hand. Can't win them all, Pat. <laughs> like the shot of Strange floating over the kid's bedroom. Look at Strange's hand. Tell me what's going on there. You can tell it's a good book because we focus so much <laughs> on like the first six pages. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That's fair. That's, that's I'm just web. saying that's web, something yeah. went right. horribly wrong inside that kid's psyche. And it's spreading if you turn the page and look at his parents' hands. <laughs> look at his look at Stephen Strange's hand as he's climbing out of the window. I love it. I was looking at her hand in that. They're both <laughs> they're both great. Anyways, other than these hands, it's fantastic. You shouldn't make fun of Stephen Strange's hands because, I mean, his are actually injured. His might just look like that. Hands are difficult, all right? So Apparently, they're hard to do consistently. <laughs> Dude's I like, I just did noticed, how yeah. many full-page spreads? These yeah, are the hands you get. Tidy hands. <laughs> These are the hands you get. Love it. Not, not to mention, like, <laughs> like he's got to put them in all sorts of weird shapes and stuff to make, you know, magic happen. Yeah, true. <laughs> Very true. So you, you gotta have... You, you, he should have practiced a little bit, I think, on that. Yeah, you're right. I do like how his cloak is, like, turned into a scarf when he's just walking down the, the street. Yeah, it's pretty rad. <laughs> and he uses it as, like, a staircase to get out of the house, too. It's nice. Little touches. 
Yeah, it's the like the little magic things that he does. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Like, he can do all this stuff, and he's like, yeah, I don't feel like using the stairs. Or or when he opens up the door when he uh, meets the librarian, who I just blanked on her name, but... She's from the Bronx, I know that. She's from the Bronx. Um, I think it's Zelma. <laughs> Zelma, yes, it's Zelma. <clears throat> Zelma of the Bronx. Uh, oh, he opens up the door and flies in on the cape. Yeah. Like, he's like, yeah, I can do pretty much anything, so uh, who uses door handles? Come on. <laughs> That's ridiculous. How do you know my name? He's got a Christmas tree up too, so he also yeah. doesn't take his Christmas tree down. So it's gonna say, we're a little late, Steve. <laughs> come on, it's <laughs> middle of January. It's got to come down. I don't know when this was written. Has the concept uh, of magic needing a price to be paid been explored before? I'm sure it has at some point, but I mean, I don't think so as much in Marvel terms. Let's see. I think that's a thing that's more new to this volume, which Tyler, feel free to correct me or add on if you have any additional knowledge of that. But well, it I don't, um, but it, it feels like uh, this took the one line from the movie a little bit and said, you know, he might have something there. <laughs> let's uh, let's see what we can do with that. And. That's kind of where this is because, gosh, right away when they meet, when you meet uh, the other sorcerers from the Marvel Universe hanging out at a bar, which I think is great. The fact that the most powerful beings potentially in Marvel are just hanging out at a bar that you can't get into unless you know magic. Just a little, their own little pocket dimension that they can yeah. pop into. Uh, with, a, with a headless or with a bodiless bartender. It's good stuff. And Monaco shows up, and that's his first line. Is the bill comes due, and you're like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> I heard that before." What is what is this all about? And uh, what it, what it does is it, it does a good job of, like he says, he's killing rabbits or whatever, drowns a rabbit, and <laughs> yeah. you know, okay, um, not the rabbits again. Yeah, not the rabbits again. <laughs> um, so it, it doesn't fully tell you what the how to balance, but you have to think it's like an eye for an eye kind of thing that. I don't think something like that's been explored. Like you always just assume the good guys are doing good. And that I, in the concept, it's interesting. It just puts such limitations on magic. Well, I mean, that's sort of the whole deal. Like superhero universes have a problem with magic in that they want there to be limits, I guess. What's the power level of Dr. Strange compared to probably over 9,000. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? Is like the reason Doctor Strange only shows up every once in a while in things, and like it's probably tough to write a Doctor Strange book, is because like dude can turn people into boxes if he wants to. Oh, <laughs> like he dude. can do anything, right? So like the way you get around that is by figuring out what the rule set or like what the limitations are to make it so that you can make a compelling narrative. And this is the, I think this is the way Jason Aaron decided to go with it is like, okay, he can do anything, but like, there's a price. Yeah, I agree. Because every time you see him, you're right. It's it's always like these big momentous things. Like, like if Doctor Strange shows up, it's because shit got real usually, right? Because he's yeah. going to do something really big and like fix stuff or try to fix stuff. So having like a smaller book like this where it's Doctor Strange on a Tuesday is tough if you don't set him up with some reason to struggle, I guess. Sure. And the fact that really other than the original comics um there's really no backstory to him you know like his like kind of how uh uh the hawkeye series that that i did the first time this is his day-to-day life when he's not with the rest of the avengers this is kind of the same idea where it's like this is just doctor strange and what he has to deal with his own shit yeah all the other comics can kind of do like spider-man you know his day-to-day life and then all of a sudden okay there's a big bad he goes fights the big bad this is kind of that same way, and yeah, you can't just have him be like, oh, bad guy, snaps his fingers and everything's fixed. There's no fun in that. So, and of course it sets up the, the rest of the plot of the story very well, with the whole robots killing other sorcerers and killing magic altogether. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's just kind of a, a good way to, to kind of balance it out. Because otherwise, yeah, what would be the point? Yeah, and I think one of the other things in the interviews I was reading that, like, Jason Aaron and editor were talking about were like a Doctor Strange comic is also tough to get 
action beats in sometimes because a lot of times he's just waving his hands so like that's why you see a lot of dr strange with a sword or dr strange with an axe in this is like they wanted to give chris Pacello like more interesting things to draw <laughs> mm-hmm. right and that uh that one line uh where he pulls out the uh the sword where he says sometimes magic won't do um and you have to get your hands dirty and pray they don't see him shake is badass yeah, pretty good. <laughs> it's 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 fantastic as he's slicing away tentacles of, of this soul eater. Like that's that's just so cool. The fact that everybody thinks Doctor Strange is just gonna wave his fingers and fix everything, and instead he's like, "Nah, man, nah, I gotta fight these things off with axes and swords and maces and the like." I think you can tell the difference between this Doctor Strange and old school Doctor Strange basically just on the fact that he's got like work boots on on that two page spread and if you look at the there's like, treads on his shoes yeah yeah like the pictures of him in the other the like opening montage like a lot of those people are wearing stockings on their feet but uh yeah so like the um like i said with like the one-liners and stuff where that kind of really humanizes him because he is known as the guy who says like the oh by the Crimson, yes. you know, like all the all the spells and stuff. The hoary ghosts of whatever. Yeah, yes. by the but Mary maggots not... of McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, and and all of a sudden, you know, when uh, uh, Zelma uh, Zelma Stanton of the Bronx um, t- takes off her hat after he goes, "There's nothing I haven't seen before," and the line is that that is a uh, I've officially never seen that before. It's fantastic. Like it just kind of. It brings him back down to the level of okay, this is this again is not like your normal what you would think you're gonna get from a Doctor Strange. On that page, I also enjoyed when she's talking about the man who woke up with the dog growing out of his chest, and he's just so matter of factly like, "I'm afraid that man died." Yeah, I'm afraid that man died. <laughs> nice bedside manner, dude. <laughs> yeah, and and then instantly makes all the demons come flying out of her head. Um, yeah, and that, that, of course, sets up the rest of the story. Somewhere far across the dimensional gulf. Another Sorcerer Supreme is having a really bad day. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing that gulf is bigger than the Gulf of Mexico, which is uh, the only gulf I could think of at the time of making that joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, that dude gets messed up by some uh, wizard-eating dogs. And he makes a bunch of butterflies up here. That and don't burn his butterflies. To say that don't even get to escape. I was like at yeah. least waiting. Like it's like oh those butterflies will show up in like the next issue. No, Boy, were you disappointed? I was a little actually. Uh, I also do like the fact that you know we all know Jason Aaron loves Ghost Rider, right? Look at those look at those robotic villains that show up. <laughs> I hadn't thought about the fact that they look exactly like the Orb until you just said that. <laughs> oh my God! It's the Orb. It's the Orb. Now, full 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 honesty, I never actually finished this series. I'm one. I'm wondering if this just wasn't all some big setup <laughs> for the orb again. Like, uh, well, okay, I do know the orb shows up, but I don't think he's connected to this storyline. <laughs> when when did orb last show up? Like, uh, uh, original sin, and that was it. And... When's the last time Jason Aaron wrote a comic book? Because that's the last time the orb showed up. The last time the orb showed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. The fact that they look like Orb totally, totally made my day. Also, after that, it leads to one of my favorite covers, I think, in all of comics history. The refrigerator? The refrigerator. Pretty good. Refrigerator with, like, Beetlejuice tentacles coming out of it. Yeah, and all the magnets on there. Which, again, I think are pictures of actual magnets. Yeah, they look real, which is pretty great. (laughs) But yeah, that was a that was a good comic because it's got a lot of funny stuff and it it does again with the art lead you in directions that you don't expect to to see and it moves the plot along nicely. But like just the goofy little stuff that you wouldn't see in other comics. Like, <laughs> are there supposed to be snakes on your coffee table? Do not talk to the snake. <laughs> snakes, snakes. Hey, girl. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> What's your hurry? It's good stuff. I think it really sets up uh, again. There's a lot of setup in this, but this definitely does a really good job. However, I'm not entirely sure what happens with the book. Uh, like, we know Zelma gets thrown away somewhere, but it doesn't really explain. Thrown away? So they open up the book, right? What book is it? The Holds of Grimroar. Grim- oh, boy. 
the yep. grimoire the grimoire of watum yeah grimoire and whatever fan looking boy uh decides to open it and <laughs> all you see is zelma and she goes flying away <laughs> it gets flung but it never really explains where she ends up or like why it was such a big deal like she meets some zombies and uh, she's still in the sanctum yeah, I mean, she just gets knocked, like, back she gets down the stairs or something. Like, down the hole, and then she opens a door yeah. that's slightly ajar, and oops, this is, like, a plane of zombies. Oh, wait, zombies. <laughs> yeah. But I guess what what's weird is the fact that all of a sudden Wong shows up like it's nothing. Wong was in the kitchen. He was making a meal. Yeah, well, yeah. Looks like my cooking. That page, I think, is the one page that actually did confuse me in this book. Is like the second panel of that page where Wong shows up and it's just a person hitting a demon with a frying pan. Like, it did yeah. take me a second to realize what was happening. Hmm. Well, that's what I mean. Like, all that was, it seems like this weird way to set up Wong. And they could have just introduced him. <laughs> because then when you next see Doctor Strange, so, okay, so Doctor Strange is like, oh, no, Zelma, right? Freaks out. And then the next time you see him, he's reading a bunch of books there. in there. So obviously it wasn't that bad. So like Also that... reminiscent of like Doctor Who. We're just like, oh god, don't do that. And then next time you see him, it's just like, oh hey. Yeah, everything's fine. I knew that was going to work out. Yeah. yeah. Wong and has you. It's fine. So I, that that sequence, I wasn't a big fan of. Just because it, it just seems like they had an idea and then they changed their mind. Eh, I'm okay with it. I think this is still depicting how crazy the Sanctum is. Yeah, yeah. this is very much showing Zelma the inside of the TARDIS, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, don't open the fridge. Ah, oh, you opened the fridge. Now I gotta cook something. <laughs> right, right. Oh, well. Now this Cthulhu entry is gonna go bad if I don't cook it now, so we're gonna have this for lunch. <laughs> gotta put this hot sauce on it. This mystical demonic hot sauce. I get what you're saying, though, Tyler. Like, it definitely feels like a scene that you can tell was sort of forced in there just to like get Wong in the picture and meanwhile Doctor Strange who was like all worried about Zelma up to that point <laughs> decides to just take a breather he's like oh thank god that's over now I can go get some reading done well he's searching for what these things are he told her that he had it under control but he doesn't know what they are so he's got to find answers right yeah. and of anyone the librarian would understand that you got to read some books read some to gain books. some knowledge Absolutely. Sure, sure. so I think it's okay that next page, I think, is my favorite of the the bits where, um, like, most of the panel is in black and white, and there's only certain bits that are in color. Her ectoplasmic trails. Yeah, the research. web, and then the web, and then Doctor Strange with his third eye open. Like, I think of the many bits where that happens, I like that one the best. I, think I don't feel the need to rank them. I, I like I'm them. not ranking them, Pat. You just said it was the best, Matthew. I don't care about the other ones, Pat. I'm not going <laughs> to rank the rest of them, unless you want me to. I will say that one, that particular spot, A, pops a lot out of the page. Like, it looks really cool. But it also, like, the other ones are almost over the top with how much color versus black and white there is. Where this one shows a very specific reason why he went into that mode. Yeah, you know? I think it's definitely the simplicity of it. And yeah. I think you're right about the fact that it's surrounded by other panels that are entirely color. I think a lot of those other ones are less like less of a contrast in the way this one is, for sure. But yeah, that's I'm covering their what now? Like <laughs> this this was a fun portion of the comic uh, of the of the of the the whole thing. But yeah, definitely that that one scene just kind of ruined it for me. <laughs> And I don't know if anybody noticed, but so like he's got all the eyes and teeth coming out of him at that point. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, this is cool. But then later on, uh, I think it's, is it the next one? He wakes up naked in a park. Yeah. Yeah. There's points where you can kind of see the scars from that. Yeah. He's still, especially when he's coming through his window, you can see. Yeah. Which I think is pretty good attention to detail. Yeah. But yeah, that's, uh, at the end of that one there, this is when you can tell like, uh, it's really starting to get bad. Well, first off, we need to talk about the his pickup line. <laughs> right. All right. Organize my books. Would you like to come sort my books sometime? Sort my books. I feel like as a pickup line, I haven't tried yet. Well, do you have enough books to make it worth sorting? Them? I want to know how Zemba <laughs> thought that was a euphemism. Sort my books. Maybe it's a librarian thing. I'll have to ask. <laughs> hey. <laughs> 
Yeah. Please yeah. let me know how that conversation goes. I'll tell you what goes. my mother, the children's librarian, says. If it would do hey, anything for her. Mom, did you ever... If a man were to say to you, to invite you to <clears throat> sort his books, how would you feel? If you say anything in the right tone, it's a euphemism, though, Pat. Like, All right. Fair enough. Yeah, that definitely uh, is, is a highlight. But yeah, I, I, have, I have some books. They're not necessarily <laughs> in order. Like, you could slip sure. in comic. Sort my comic books. That actually would take someone a while for me. <laughs> that wouldn't take as long for me. Most of mine are in order. Like I said, they're just in a different city. So <laughs> oh, I just have to go get them. So but, it's a lot of heavy lifting, then, if someone were to come. Yeah. All right. But they're mostly in order. But, like, you know, I've got, I've got books. I, I could probably... The, the Freakonomics issues probably aren't in order. Like, probably sort them better <laughs> well try yeah. out that line tyler let us know how it goes all right when also you let me know how it goes when you try out this line or ask your yeah. mom about it don't you dare ask my mom to show your books tyler what the hell? <laughs> yeah so this one ends with a really depressing bit that may be real sad that yeah. same sorcerer supreme who looks like he's gone through some shit already it's a different one, actually, because he's got a different. A diff- one? He, he has a different eye of whatever the heck. <laughs> Egamako. Yeah, and the other one was like Thelma or something. Yeah, it was the eye of Thelma. And this one's the I don't know Aga, A- Agamako. Listen, it's up for interpretation. You can call whatever eye whatever you want. But he, he made it so close. Yeah, he was certainly the closest to being able to uh, stop what's coming. It is like the exact same cliffhanger, right? Which kind of takes a little bit of the power out of it. Well, it takes the power out of finding the tree of dead Sorcerer Supremes, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, we know they're being killed off. He's been ignoring them for the past two issues. He so much has been ignoring them. It's the fact that... Just doesn't know. (laughs) He just doesn't know. He's got his own stuff to do, man. He's got euphemisms to... He's got librarians to hit on, yeah. Yeah. But in the next issue... We gotta admit there is some good stuff. The fact that the dogs are barking at things no one can see, like dogs do in real life. And I like that bit. But yeah, then there's a bunch of giant slugs. And Doctor Strange naked, fighting giant slug. <laughs> Very tastefully naked. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of uh, uh, well-placed censorship. There's some flowers, there's some captions, there's some just straight-up black bars. Right, the, the, the black bar. The... Very shadowy all of a sudden, I don't know. I mean, the black bar over Doctor Strange's ass as he's flying towards his house is the best bit in the entire book, right? We can agree on that. When he's riding the slug. Yeah. yeah. So, but did anybody notice uh, on the very first page, there's like somebody drawing, and there's like a drawing of Doctor Strange naked with a black bar across his oh, front yeah, bit? Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, they kind of go back to it. Someone's channeling uh, has a, the third eye open, I guess. Mm-hmm. The dogs and that, that, that person. Yeah, he fights slugs and makes the entire city of New York vomit. Hey, in the next page, there's... What the heck? In the, the big splash screen of all the giant slugs, the woman who's drawing something, or maybe the girl's handing her... Yeah, the, her daughter's handing her an illustration. It's the picture of the evil guy killing the whale. Oh, it is. Holy crap, yeah. What that doesn't hell? happen. <laughs> this girl who's got flowers sprouting out, sprouting out of her head, which probably indicates that she has some sort of magical awareness. Action, yeah. It's foretelling the future. Hey, look, Mom. This terrible thing's going to happen at the end of this book. This is really violent. Uh, I think we need to take you to a therapist. I don't know. That, I never noticed that. That's pretty cool. And it also looks realistic, like it, like... It's a literal panel, I think. Yeah, no, it definitely is. Like, it fits on the piece of paper really well. I get what Tyler's saying. That is funny. I never noticed that. That's cool. There you go. Discovering things in the Waiting on the Trade podcast. Mid-recording. Fantastic. This issue to me was really weird in that it kind of felt like a first issue again in issue three, if that makes sense. A little bit, yeah. Because he doesn't know what's going on again. And, like, it's like, hey, this is my deal. And it's like, yeah, I, I know. I've been reading. I read the first issue and the second one. There's all these invisible creatures that people don't know. I know you, you told us. Yeah, I and it kind of it kind of beats the same drum of wow, we've never seen these before. Yeah, 
what's going on kind of thing. Something weird is happening. And like Tyler, you were talking about how you didn't love that Wong introduction scene in issue two. Like this Wong introduction feels really natural. It just like kind of like there's a caption that says, but not as much as it sucks to be my assistant. And then Wong talks and then you see Wong. Yeah, that would this like if this was the second issue, like if they swapped them somehow, like made this a continuation and then uh, had Wong show up, I think it would be a way more a better flow. You so know? Are, are the slugs extra dimensional or not? Like, can, is Wong opening his third eye to, to slice them, or can he just like sense where they are and his swords can interact with them? Pat, can I be real with you? I'm just saying it makes <laughs> sense that the projected astral body of Doctor Strange can see these things and interact with them, but Wong does not have an, a third eye. A third open. eye open, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I want consistency. I can do as bizarre as you want, but if you set up some sort of rules, you got to stick with it. There's only one rule in this book, Pat, and that's magic has a price. Other than that, anything goes. I'm I'm not entirely sure. Also, like some panels are the black and white with the slugs only having colors. But in this one, there's color and there's slugs. So have they I like... It, okay, I think I've got you actually, Pat. I think I've got it for you. It's because they're in the house. <laughs> Yeah. So they take on, they manifest in this plane inside the sanctum. Yeah, because like well, you can see Doctor Strange's astral form and his physical form in there, right? So yeah, like, I was confused by that too. It's like, wait, what? So it's because they're in, it's because they're in the house. Marvel can send me my no prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, sure. Well, they, I mean, they do talk a lot about how uh, the the house is its own kind of almost dimension. Sure. A few times. It's a special house. It's been a lot of things. It's been many, yeah. many things. <laughs> so, I mean... I, I do like the explosion effect at the very end. It's very pretty. Yeah, I think that's my favorite yeah. page in this issue, for sure. Like, just because of the, the colors. It actually, that explosion effect reminds me a lot of the Delirium story from Sandman. Yes, the, <laughs> it's a completely different medium that they just tossed into this. Yeah, and like it being black and white and color and a different media, like yep. it's very, very composite in the same way that that delirium story is. And they shout out Cleveland. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, then of course after the slug fight, we find you, out you... it's real gone. Something's really, really bad happening in the magical nexus. Yeah. Like uh, that one definitely the black and white. Paints a way more grim picture. Oh yeah, when it shows it. So like, where all the other black and white photos kind of show this fantastical realm of different dimensional beings, and they're all colorful, and not all of them are bad, but some of them are bad. This one's like, this is bad. <laughs> yeah, and it's more of like a like a gray too, right? Where the yeah. other ones like, this is the real world, this is the magical world, and this is like, this is the magical world, but it doesn't have magic in it. Yeah, and you can just tell like how uh, like both of them are are definitely distraught when they find them, and then you get the the orbs. Yeah, and my my least favorite page of the entire book. And the whale. It's so unnecessary. Like I already get they killed two sorcerers supreme. Like you don't need to like this whale didn't do anything. Spectre is not a fan of whales. I hate it. <laughs> Take it back. I don't want it. <laughs> well, and two, why? They don't really explain as to what this whale thing is here for. Yeah, it's just big. It's big and innocent, and they kill it. It's they cool. demonstrate how evil the evil guy is. Yes, he'll torture old men, but also innocent whales. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, I just kind of found that weird, and you know, it's definitely sad because the red blood is really the only color on the whole damn thing, other than his eye beams. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Empirical. Empirical. Oh. That took me three reads too, Pat. <laughs> I thought it was a Pokemon. It's like if Cthulhu did math. Also, the dude's got a very collector vibe going. Like he's got all sorts of people and different torture devices. He doesn't really collect them. He like No, he's just murdering them one by yeah. one, but you know. They're definitely not mint in the box, Tyler. <laughs> There's Witchfinder Wolves. Yeah, and there's they talk about the Inquisition. These people, I don't know. 
don't like them. Already don't like them before they kill yeah. the big innocent space. Or I guess not space whale, magic whale. I'm <laughs> still in Doctor Who mode, I guess. And you know, like, that's supposed to be like the big reveal of them. And I guess it does its job because you hate them because of it. But yeah, there's been better, like, big bad reveals. Well, I mean, this isn't really the reveal. They've been killing Sorcerer Supremes the past two volumes as well. I guess my thing with it is it just feels unnecessary given the stuff we've already gotten and the fact that it doesn't actually advance the plot. Like, are talking about the whale? Yeah, like bad guys yeah. are bad. Oh no, <laughs> didn't know that. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm with you there. That's I like. It seems like an unnecessary thing, but whatever. What do I know? I don't write comics. I just talk about them on <laughs> podcasts. Yeah, we just yeah. criticize. That's all we do. Yeah. I wonder if they, instead of like a weird whale, if it was something more like commonly thought to be magic, they should be slicing a unicorn in half. Is what he really should be doing. Still yeah. not good. Still yeah. not good though, Pat. But like a random whale. It's like okay, is it magical? I mean, it can fly, so like it's obviously magical, Pat. It's flying. <laughs> flying things don't mean magic. There's not just a one for one. All right. Well, you tell me the next time you see a flying whale in real life, Pat. Send me a picture. Matthew, these are comic books. It's also comic books in a different dimension. A creature that's, could fly. That's true. Okay, I'll give you that. It could just be the rules of that dimension allow whales to fly. These yes. are the things we get into on this like, podcast. If like his, his little spiny bits were glowing, I give you maybe there was some like magic there, but it's just a gray whale. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. The, the rocks are just there. They're, yeah. They're not like they're, yeah, it, I don't get a, it. It's a weird panel. Yep, it's very, it's very, dare I say it, strange. Oh, ah, ah. it's the first time we did that, so that's okay. You get a free pass. It's you know, I have a unicorn, and I'll be happy. That's all I want. That's it, yep. Jason Aaron. If you listen to this, next time you write Doctor Strange comic, kill a unicorn. Do it. <laughs> Jeez. And you have I three. I feel like that's not the correct guaranteed. lesson. That's not the correct lesson. It could, even, it could even be like a Pegasus unicorn hybrid, so it is flying, and then he cuts it in half, and it crumples to the ground. Right, that'd make a lot more magical sense than like, it's flying if it's I a got Pegasus. What you, right? I got what you're throwing out, Jason. I got so it. wait, wait, wait. You think that the creature that has wings yeah. and can fly is more magical than a whale that can fly? Yes! I don't know the rules of, of this dimension, but it's an established fact that unicorns are magical. Wings are no wings. But I don't. I I am fine dying on this hill. This is it. This is the sword he falls on. I don't blame him. I keep yeah. on having to look at this page because we keep talking about this. We have to. We have to move on. <laughs> I was ready to move on long ago. I hate looking at this page. Let's move on to the coolest page of the ancient one you probably ever see. Punch me as hard as you can. He he just looks like a like a bad mother in this one. I do love the mentors that are a dick archetype. I'm here for yeah. it. I like it. Also, is that a hat or is that just a really aggressive unibrow? I can't quite tell. I think, I think it's a hat, but it could be could be unibrow. Because he's an ancient one. If he doesn't keep that, that unibrow trimmed, All right, I suppose it's, it's we could... definitely a hat, but I think it's supposed oh, yeah, it to be hat. purposely confusing on the first page. Yeah. Um, I love how the vomit is really the only thing colored in those first uh, few pages, too. Yep, very good. Especially the like little tiny bit of yellow in that big panel at the top, at the bottom of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, then he explains later on that he puked for three days straight. I don't remember eating. Oh, oh, why is it glowing? Oh. <laughs> yeah. But now, you know, we kind of criticize the other one kind of being this the same setup. This one kind of has that same feel a little bit in the fact that we already talked about Origin, but this one, I guess, does set up the there's a price to pay kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, this one's definitely pretty necessary for the, the reveal that's coming later of Wong has a secret. <laughs> I guess yeah. my, only, my only confusion here is that in the opening, when they went to the bar with no doors, that crazy old magician who's like, oh, the bill's coming. They laughed him off. But obviously the Sorcerer Supreme knew about this and is an actual thing that he has to deal with on a daily basis. So why were they making light of that dude saying you need to pay. I don't know if they laughed him off so much as like Steven was trying to assert that he was paying the bill, but I don't think Steven knows how he's paying the bill. Like, <laughs> dude, I am. I'm paying it. Well, and, I don't know. You know, you, 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 uh, I see what you mean, Pat, and I kind of wonder the same thing because I'm, 
Matt's right. He kind of is like, dude, what do you want from me? Because he talks about that in here, or doesn't he? Where he talks about puking up his soul and all that. Or is that the first one? I think that's in the first one, actually. Yeah, so he's talking about doing all that, so he's paying the price, right? But you look at the rest of them, and they're, they're, you know, they all look like they're willing to kill some rabbits. <laughs> you know? And you wonder if Strange just wasn't told what he's supposed to be doing. And but the rest never... of them are like, dude, yeah, no, you didn't know that? Like, that's not a... We're supposed to be killing rabbits. Not When's the last no. time Wanda, like, barfed her guts up? Or, like, right. can't never <laughs> human food anymore? It's like, are they just hazing, Steve? <laughs> it's like... I think because his magic is like so much more powerful than theirs. Yeah. And like his, his job is harder. <laughs> more forbidden knowledge is known to the Sorcerer Supreme. Also, let's not go into whatever the Scarlet Witch's deal is because no one knows Pat. <laughs> no one knows. That's true. But like the, the one thing too with that same argument though is Voodoo, Dr. Voodoo, was the Sorcerer Supreme at one point. Oh, hey. So you think he would have said something? You know, like, yeah, puking up your soul isn't what's supposed to happen, because I've been there, man. <laughs> like, yeah, come on. Yeah, this is, I think, one of those Marvel comics that kind of plays fast and loose with the continuity of Marvel comics, which you kind of have to do every once in a while, right? Like, it's been 50 years, so. Sure, but I, again, I put such strict limitations to using magic that just makes me sad. <laughs> just, like, the fact that you have to give up so much to be the Sorcerer Supreme. I think what's really cool about how that's set up and the eventual reveal that Wong has basically like set up other people to pay the price is that like Steven thinks he's been paying the price this entire time and he actually has not at all, right? Like to well, the that, degree. that's also really sad though, right? Because it's it's really weighing heavily on Steve the small portion of the price that he has been paying. He's still incredibly messed up and he's paying 10%. <laughs> he's paying yeah. the minimum payment on the credit card. <laughs> Yeah, and he's wondering why the interest keeps piling up. <laughs> yeah, there definitely is that where it makes you feel for him at the end. Where you're like, man, he has no idea what he's in for. And goddamn, he thought he was, was doing everything he could. And really, man, <laughs> you're, you're in trouble. This, this is really going to come back to bite you. Which almost makes Wong the villain. Almost. I was going to say, like, not informing the Sorcerer Supreme that the spells and magic he's using have such a catastrophic cost. Like, that's knowledge that would be necessary. Right, you think he should know what he's doing? It seems negligent <laughs> to, like, throw out these powers when he's using it because he thinks he is the only one paying the price for using it. Oh, yeah, I definitely, like, when he, I think it's the next issue where he's like, oh, yeah, Wong is the only person I trust, absolutely. It's like, that's gonna, that's gonna not be true by the end of the whole run. <laughs> like, that's gonna come to a head later on, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's in the, the last issue. Training human batteries is sort of a little messed up. Yeah, so in this one, it starts with him warning all the other magicians that something's coming. Yeah, and, and he says he yeah. tried to summon all the other sorcerers supreme and no one was left. <laughs> There's no other source of spray. Which, way to go, our dimension. Last one to survive. Woot woot. Well, there might be other ones, but they may not come. <laughs> like, yeah, they don't, they don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Just lay yeah. low. Maybe they're hiding somewhere. This also has the cool water scenes where yeah. it's, it's real water. And then there's comic books stuff drawn on top drawn of over it. it. Which yeah. is super sweet. And like the photo or like the panel where Wong's walking through what I assume is like the Himalayas or something. Looks like it's basically an actual picture with some inks yeah. thrown over the top of it, and then Wong's there. Yeah, I really dig all those. That's a great technique. And of course, it's got the the setup of nothing's impossible. <laughs> and then he's like, "Oh wait, that's impossible. <laughs> that's impossible." <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and all the books die. Yeah, and I like that Zelma's back because I enjoyed her in the first couple issues. They die very dramatically too. They don't just like die on the shelves. They throw themselves off the shelves. Right, they yeah. commit suicide. It's like, jeez, book, come on. They like know it's over, so they're like, screw it, and just just jump. Yeah, and then of course this is this is like not quite the big setup reveal. Obviously, that's the next issue, but yeah, he there's the wolves. I think that last page where he's like, they're here, and all those wolves are. Just da staring down at him like, now nah, we got you. It was really cool. Those witch hunter wolves. Gotta watch out. Yeah. 
so then of course we go to the last issue and this is when this is this is the one this is the controversial one what do you think is in the cellar i don't know <laughs> i actually like made a point of not reading ahead because i didn't want it to affect like how i felt about these issues when we talked about it mm-hmm. like that's probably the number one thing i honestly like don't really care about the empirical at all like i much preferred the day in the life of dr strange issues to the issues at the end of this where it's big fighty times but like the yeah. thing that keeps me going or like one of the things that's gonna hook me into the next volume for sure is like i gotta know what's in that cellar <laughs> yeah the, there's that's the mystery to to keep it interested for sure but i agree like i like the day-to-day comics more where it's like this is what he's dealing with all the time. Yeah, like end of end of magic is whatever. I don't really care because like magic's probably going to be okay. <laughs> what about that whale? The whale, I care. Well, that's the thing. Like, I'd rather he rescue the whale. <laughs> but yeah, so the cellar, like, Steve wasn't surprised that he was unconscious, brought to the cellar, and then wakes up conscious in a bed and feels better. So whatever the cellar is, is supposed to be helping him pay the price. Yeah, he doesn't need to be fully cogent to use it yeah which makes it more interesting yeah like what's there that you don't have to be conscious to be able to is it like an entity or something in the cellar that like i don't know it's supposed to help him pay the price but it's also not obviously working well enough because wong goes off and makes his secret problematic (laughs) well i don't even has he used it before is wong just making the assumption that it wouldn't work and sets up this as an alternative oh maybe that's a good question actually oh yeah Although it sounds like, oh, I don't know, maybe. Because I assumed they'd used it before, I guess, from the dialogue, but they never really... Maybe, I don't know. Well, just, well, Steven, you can't keep doing this. The seller isn't. So maybe, yeah. I could see either being correct, maybe. What's hmm. in the seller? I don't know. I'm going to find out later today. <laughs> but yeah, then we get to see what Wong's solution to the problem is. And it's pretty horrific. <laughs> pretty terrible. Yeah, like, so the whale killing is bad. The using people as human batteries is well it's worse. Of course he definitely has the um they're doing this for the greater good kind of speech. But he also comes off very super villain esque when he's like, This is what I trained them for. This is what I'm doing this for for the betterment. Like, okay, dude, calm down. We get it. You're you're trying something, but I don't know if this is the way to be going about it. Yeah, he, yeah, the other one guy's like, they aren't batteries to be used up and tossed away. And Wong's like, oh, but they're batteries. I trained them to be batteries. Yeah. That's what their use is. Like, Damn, Wong. Batteries are exactly what they are. What they've been trained to be, what I trained them to be. Yeah, pretty, Wong. Pretty heavy. Not cool, Wong. <laughs> Wong, you, you've got a price that needs to be paid <laughs> that's going to be coming up. Yeah. But yeah, then they get found by the uh, Empirical and their wolves. And we get one of those classic Marvel, hey, they're everywhere, even in these locations you might recognize from other Marvel comics. Right. Shit's going I bad everywhere. I do like the uh, the Florida Everglades scene, though. That is that is a nice, uh, here's a supernatural being that we don't talk about that often. Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing. <laughs> Wait, no. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not Swamp Thing, but I don't know no, what it's, it is. Shit. It's Man Thing. Was Man Thing DC or is Swamp Thing DC? Swamp Thing's DC. <laughs> What is this thing? This is Man Thing. (laughs) Is it really called Man Thing? Yeah. All your faves are here. You got the the High Evolutionary place off in Wondagore. You got... I don't even know what Weird weird World's deal is. That's too esoteric Marvel bullshit for me. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know what that one is either, to be completely honest. But then, of course, you've got, you know, the skies above New York and people already fighting the shit. Yeah, it's not going great. No. And then, of course, uh, I do like... Also, again, another Ghost Rider callback. Get behind me, Monaco. This thing's loaded with Hellfire Buckshot. Damn straight. They got a Hellfire Shotgun in this thing. Jason Aaron, you wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> Just slipping in Ghost Rider stuff everywhere he can. I'm telling you, Tyler, the orb does show up in this run. I think it's near the end. It's going to be very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's after all this stuff is dealt with. It's oh, like okay. issue like night 17 or 19 or something. And they just shoot him on sight thinking he's part of the empirical empirical they're back <laughs> and we deal with you already and he's like no no it's not just a z-list z-list villain leave me alone yeah then you got the the 
the fact that he realizes all the spells don't work when he's fighting off the wolves, except for the eye of Agamotto. Yeah, yeah. His, his sword fails. We've all been there. One out of five. <laughs> <laughs> that that Atlantean black magic is some some rough stuff. Yeah, this this comic reads really fast because there's not a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of pages that like don't have Doctor Strange in them too. I think. Which... Yeah, for being a Doctor Strange comic, different. It's gonna show but... the magic. Magic's being attacked everywhere. I mean, the whole book kind of read quickly to me, which I think is partly due to the fact that it's laid out in such a way that you read it quickly, like your eye is drawn across the page correctly, and thus you go through it more quickly than you would if it wasn't. But it's a whole volume of setup, right? <laughs> it yeah. is, right? Like, which is kind of again my thing with it is like, oh, okay, so the whole next volume is going to be this thing that I'd like. I'm less interested in than Doctor Strange goes to a hockey game or something like that. I don't know. I'm interested in it. You have just become jaded with all your comic book reading. That's probably true, actually. But I, I do like some of the simple stuff that it shows too. Like he tries to use the knife to levitate, and then it drops when when he, and he's just like, "Uh, crap!" and uh, has to start swinging the sword and fighting him off, and then it breaks, you know, and vomiting black ribbon as he like literally spiraled through the sky yeah i imagined him just like literally cartwheeling through the like around the world based on how that panel is drawn i mean there's definitely a sense of optimism at the end like with zelma she's all like oh wow you, you, you beat them all and uh you know everyone's kind of like okay thank god that's over who's the the person who's falling in in Crying the empirical, the empirical are. I think that's Dr. Voodoo. It looks like Voodoo, yeah. Which is a big deal, because that guy used to be the Sorcerer Supreme. Yeah. And there's more of them. There's more of them. It would be really cheap if he just, like, that's kind of the thing, actually, is, like, for all this run is, like, oh, I'm going to swing swords and stuff. The thing that is the big deus ex machina of this issue is, like, Dr. Strange vomits <laughs> black tendrils and cartwheels around the world. Like, it's very much the thing they've been not leaning into the rest of the run, where he just waves his hands and things are fixed, which obviously they're not fixed, so there's going to be more. But but then, too, this also gets into one of the uh, other things. Like, this seems like a pretty massive threat. Like, at what point does he call his friends? You know? I would just be like, where's Spider-Man during this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, somewhere, somewhere, uh, you know, Steve Rogers is yelling Avengers. <laughs> you know, like, you gotta assemble here. Uh, and, like, Doctor Strange is, like, a machine that, it, like, affects magic. That's impossible. Meanwhile, I think in another book that's co-written by Jason Aaron, Iron Man can literally absorb the Phoenix Force with his armor. Is the Phoenix Force magic? No, but, like, it's a cosmic nonsense force, right? Like, Yeah, but this is this is definitely one of those things where it's like, Doctor Strange shouldn't be doing this one alone. Like, this one... I feel like he's going to need some help. For and sure. at what point, at what point, if this is flying over New York, are the other heroes coming to show up? It's very foreboding. And it, it's reminiscent to me of Tyler, your last uh, uh, Ghost Rider, where like hell has taken over heaven and, and the other Ghost Rider gets sent down to, to Earth and like everything is fucked. It's just like, oh, look, it's this, but it's Doctor Strange now. There's no magic. It is Jason Aaron. He did write them both. (laughs) No, I mean, it's like one for one, which I'm fine with because I felt pretty bad reading the first one and I feel pretty bad reading this one. So unlike Matt, I want to know what happens. I don't want to know what happens. I want to, like, legitimately, I will keep reading it if only to know what's going on in the cellar and also to see Doctor Strange say, Wong, you done fucked up. (laughs) Man, I hope he words it that way. What if, Matt, what if another whale joins the fight for magic and like is the reason that they win then we'll come on and record some bonus content and just be like 10 out of 10 read it (laughs) read the comic don't rule it out honestly don't rule it out there's a there's a there's a chance that's exactly what happens all right stay tuned listeners it's in series on amazon it says 2015 to 2018 was the run yeah so that seems that's about right cool yeah, I will definitely read the next one and not just because I already bought it. Like, if we, 
this is one where I think I'd wait for it to go on sale or like I'd track it down at the library. Like I don't think I would pick it up for full price, but I'm definitely interested enough that it's on my list of it's on my list of stuff to read for sure. Yeah, I want to finish it. The fact that I never really did, and it was for various different reasons that I never got around to actually uh, finishing it. It kind of was like, well, that was dumb, Tyler. What the hell? Like, <laughs> this this actually has a pretty damn good cliffhanger. Because, uh, like I, I said before we started recording, as a standalone five issues, this is okay because it does the job of wanting you to read more. But it definitely doesn't tell the whole story. It's definitely read. the first half of a story. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you're going to read this read it all like if you better be invested into into the whole the whole thing whale killing and everything else <laughs> yeah tyler do you have any recommendations for um if someone like this book something else they should read the rest of this book like <laughs> the rest of them um you know this one i'm gonna be honest i didn't put much thought into it because <laughs> there's not a lot that goes like it it's really kind of its own standalone thing um but I guess, yeah, I, th- I think I would just go with, with the rest of them. That feels legitimate on this one, because like, it ends on such a cliffhanger, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess one similar to it that kind of has more one-and-done issues that's also very out there, the Moon Knight run that came out at about the same time. I think I've suggested that before, so one of these days it's probably going to be our <laughs> be the one I pick. But the uh, the Moon Knight run that was going at this time also has some very strange psychedelic issues that are that are pretty out there but they're not they all don't connect as well as this one does this one tells the story that one was a one and done rogue of the day uh you know issue by issue kind of thing but the art is similar and the over the top craziness is similar so i would say moon knight that came out at this time and that for the life of me, can't remember who wrote it. I think it's a Warren Ellis book. It is Warren Ellis. That's yeah, that's who wrote it because it was a big deal when he came on for it. I remember Marvel was like, "Yeah, we got this Warren Ellis guy." Yeah, that book is good. Yeah, but that Moon Knight run, read that. <laughs> read that if you like this. Cool. Uh, what's your recommendation? Uh, I mean, if you're gonna go with magic, I unfortunately have more DC experience than I do Marvel. So, of course, I got to go with Constantine Hellblazer. It's got a similar magic comes at a cost feel to it. And Constantine is just great. Dry (laughs) sense of humor, even in the face of literal demons. Uh, I think the issue that I would point people to is all his engines. Is a really good one. It's its own standalone story, which is nice. And then, I don't know, just feeling-wise, I sort of got uh, lock and key vibes from this a little bit. So I would say, if you're looking for more magic, mystery, not sure what's going on, sometimes pretty bizarre art and panel layouts, uh, lock and key is a pretty great series to read through. That's a great recommendation. (laughs) Well, thank you, man. (laughs) Way better than Moon Knight. (laughs) (laughs) No, I was just like, I hadn't thought of, I hadn't jump to lock and key from this, but I think there is a lot that's similar in a way that if you liked this, you would definitely like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Because this gave me such like Dr. Who vibes. I ended up like settling on the most Dr. Who Marvel comic, which is Dan slot and Mike Alred's silver surfer run, which is basically what if the silver surfer was Dr. Who. (laughs) Nice. There's less of like a, a big bad coming storm sort of feeling to it. It's a lot more like, one or two and dones, but it's definitely got the hey, here's strange stuff that's happening in the Marvel universe, and you have the Silver Surfer who's experienced in everything because he's been around forever at this point, and you've got um, uh, his companion, I guess Don, kind of like going with him throughout the entirety of the Marvel universe, and it's really good. It sounds cool. Heck yeah! <laughs> I think Doctor Strange shows up in that book actually. Sweet. There's yeah, a, I remember when that book came out. That was a that was a big deal. That book did really well. Yeah, it's really like probably the most notable issue of it is the issue where Dan Slott like makes the entire issue into a Mobius strip. <laughs> <laughs> so like you read the top of the pages for half the comic, and then you go to the bottom, and then you loop back and read the top as you're like coming back through the book, and then the bottom, 
and you have to figure out how to escape the strip to like flip to the last couple pages. <laughs> nice. oh, so good. That's that's pretty wild. Yeah. So yeah, I think if you like this book, you'd probably like that book. Though that book's a little bit more it's a little le- more lighthearted and less creepy than this book, I guess. Hmm. But similar tone. Sure. I can dig it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think again for joining us, Tyler. We're going to have you on again and again and again. I hope you realize this. We, many, uh, many times. Yep. Yeah, not getting right now. <laughs> That's fine. I am more than happy to be on here. Thanks again for having me on this time. Assuming you want to be found online, where can people find you online if they want to enjoy more of your bullshitting about Dr. Strange and Funko Pops? <laughs> uh, you can always find me at Twitch on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash mbracer777. And then on. Uh, Twitter at uh, Real Marifki. There you go. Find me there. And we'll, of course, have links to those in the show notes. And we'll have links to where you can find Pat and myself on Twitter as at Watt Podcast. And you can email us at waitingonthetrade at gmail.com. Tyler, this was a hoot. <laughs> yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm glad you guys liked the comic. And uh, I hope it goes on sale soon so I can buy the rest of it since you guys got to buy the rest of it already. <laughs> I just got my stimulus check, so I suppose hey. I, could, I could support the economy that way. Buying digital books off of Amazon. Jeff Bezos needs that stimulus <laughs> money. All boxes yep. and Bezos in the end. Uh, boxes and Bezos in the end, you betcha. Now I'm sad again. <laughs> okay.